Welcome to this continuing chapter two lecture on ions, molecules, and atoms. In this video, I will teach you about molecular compounds names and formulas. <laughs> so when naming molecular compounds, which is compounds made of all nonmetals, such as SO2 or CH4, we follow these rules. And these of course contrast a little bit with naming ionic compounds that I discussed in our previous video linked to in the description below. One, the atom on the left in our formula is given its regular name straight off of the periodic table. Now, if this leftmost atom has a subscript number to its right in the formula, then we also add the prefix di for two, tri for three, tetra for four, penta for five, and so forth at the start of the name. Now, just so you know, we never use the prefix mono for the left atom. So if you have a formula such as these formulas right up here that have an implied one next to the leftmost atom, in this case a sulfur or in this case a carbon, you do not use mono ever to indicate one in a molecular compound name. You never use mono for the first element. Now for the element on the right, we do use the word mono if we have an implied one next to it. Okay? Rule two, the atom on the right in our formula is given its regular name straight off of the periodic table, except that the last few letters get replaced with the suffix "-ide". Now, if this rightmost atom has a subscript next to its right, then we also tack on the prefixes mono if the implied subscript right here number is one, Di for two, tri for three, tetra for four, and so forth. Penta, then hexa, then hepta, then octa, then nana, and deca. And that's as high as you need to know, I think. All right, let's take a look at some examples. What is the correct name for PF5? All right, to do this, we will follow our rules, beginning with rule one. The atom on the left in our formula is given its regular name. Now, the letter P represents phosphorus on the periodic table. So we just write down the first half of our name as being phosphorus. Now there is an implied one right here. So anytime you don't have a subscript number here, it's an implied one. However, we need to remember that we never use the prefix mono for the leftmost element, even if there is only one of that element in the formula. So we're done with step one. Step two, the atom on the right in our formula, in this case fluorine, is given its regular name straight off of the periodic table, except the last few letters get replaced with the suffix ide. So you'll notice that fluorine right here is on the right in a formula, so we would write down fluoride instead of fluorine. You'll also notice that there is a number right here, a subscript five. So if it has a subscript number to its right in the formula, then we also have to add the appropriate prefix. Mono for one, di for two, tri for three, tetra for four, penta for five, hexa for six, hepta for seven, octa for eight, nana for nine, and deca for 10. So in this case, we have a pentafluoride. So the final correct name for this molecular compound is phosphorus pentafluoride. Make sense? Good. Let's do another one. What is the correct name for CO2? We follow the same rules for this. Number one, the atom on the left in our formula is given its regular name. The letter C on the periodic table represents carbon. So we just slap that down and we don't write down mono next to it, even though there is only one carbon atom in this formula. Rule number two, the atom on the right is given its regular name, except we take off the last few letters and add the suffix ide at the end of it. Okay. So this is oxygen. So instead of calling it oxygen, we call it oxide. Now, if you have a number to the right of it in the formula, in this case we do, we also have to add a prefix corresponding to that number. The number here is two. So we have to add the prefix di before writing oxide in our name. Thus, this compound is called carbon dioxide. You got it? Cool. Let's test your mastery further by taking a look at this example. What is the correct name for this compound CO? We'll follow the exact same rules. We write down the name for the element on the left in our formula, which is of course carbon. Now for the element on the right, we're also like our previous example, going to call it oxide. However, because it's on the right in the formula, we actually do write down a mono where applicable or a di or a tri or a tetra and so forth. Because there's no subscript written here, it is an implied one and one corresponds to the prefix mono. So the correct name for this compound is carbon monoxide. Now you might ask, why don't we call it monocarbon monoxide? Remember, we never use the prefix mono for the element that's on the left in the formula. We only use the prefixes di and above. Now you might ask why that confusing rule? I don't know, I'm not the one that invented it, I'm just the one who teaches it. Let's do one more. The correct name for this compound is what? As per usual, we'll follow our rules. One, the atom on the left is given its regular name. In this case, sulfur. 
However, you'll notice that this atom has a number next to it that is not one, it's a two, which means that we do have to add the prefix for two and the prefix for two is di. So the first half of our name is going to be disulfur. Now on to step two, the atom on the right is given its name except we tack on the suffix ide at the end and the prefix that corresponds to the number in its subscript. So this is not called fluorine in our name, it's called fluoride and it has a number 10 next to it. What prefix do we use for 10? Yeah, it's a deca. Hence the total correct name for this formula is disulfur decafluoride. Now I stressed this in our earlier video on naming ionic compounds, but in case there's any confusion, please remember that ionic compounds, which have metals and non-metals stuck to each other, we do not use any prefixes, di, tri, mono, penta, hexa, and so forth for ionic compounds. We only use these prefixes for molecular compounds.